This is the Seller Process Podcast, where we talk about the best systems, processes, and SOPs for your Amazon business so that you can regain control of your time, build up your team, and scale your e-com empire. Welcome to all entrepreneurs and change makers. Gianmarco here, all the way from beautiful Sicily. And this is the first episode of the Seller Process Podcast. To kick off this podcast in style, we brought an ex-Amazonian to the show, George Raid. George used to work with Amazon. Now he runs an Amazon consultancy that specializes in advertising and listing optimization. His blog that you can find at georges.blog sends out weekly and monthly newsletters that he describes as a potent headshot of enlightening Amazon content. George, welcome. We are thrilled to be enlightened by your knowledge. I feel a bit guilty now, um, <laughs> making it such a hard intro there with the enlightening um, and potent. It's tough for a second language, but thank you so much, Joe Mark. I'm really excited to come and chat to you, hopefully deliver some value. And I'm really delighted to be the first guest as well. It was like an honor. Sounds great, sounds great. So guys, in this episode, we'll talk about a framework to help you prioritize more effectively so that you can focus on the best direction to grow your business. About the topic of prioritization, I typically see entrepreneurs getting stuck because of any of these two reasons. One, either they, they put lots of effort on trying to solve the wrong problem or they try to solve too many problems at the same time. So George, here's the, is my first question for you. In your experience with consulting and brand management, what have you seen being the most common mistakes Amazon sellers make in making business decisions and prioritizing them? Yeah, good question. I think when it comes to Amazon, a lot of people when they first start are very enthusiastic and they want they want things to get going as quickly as possible, which makes sense. You want to feed that algorithm data, get sales going um, and capitalize on that halo effect that Amazon gives you. So the urgency is true. But what I see a lot of uh, kind of early adopters or people coming onto Amazon straight away doing is they're too early when it comes to things like advertising. Uh, they're not focusing on some of the fundamental pillars of uh, an Amazon strategy before they start driving paid traffic. So paid traffic is obviously exciting because we can accelerate visibility for our products, which in theory should drive sales. But if we're not actually working hard to convert those customers because we haven't optimized our content, then it's kind of a waste of time. And I think that's probably one of the biggest mistakes I see is they're very early to send traffic, but it's often too early or they're too early to launch because they haven't got their house in order. Exactly, exactly. I totally agree. And you basically just uh, kind of gave a, a hint of what's going to be, you know, the meat and potatoes of this episode, <laughs> which is going to be basically the what, what we spoke about uh, in our pre-chat um, interview, in, in our interview uh, pre-call. Uh, it basically was the, the mountain strategy. It's a framework that you you're using in your in your business to to help to help the brands prioritize better. So can you talk a little bit more about what is this uh, framework and how can that help us prioritize better? Mm -hmm. I think this, this framework initially stemmed from my time at Amazon and when I was working with a lot of the strategic sellers on the platform and the things I noticed time and time again of those succeeding were they had a very simple model rather than overcomplicating things. They had a simple thing that they always went back to time and time again. And the more I broke it down, and ultimately when I left, I started to notice it more as I was creating my own content. And I segmented up into three different areas. And I wanted to make it as simple as possible because if we create these fancy models, it can be distracting or we can send us off in the wrong direction. So the premise is quite simple. Imagine yourself a pyramid, and I'm sure you can share the diagram in the notes. The bottom stage is your operations, the middle stage is your brand, and the top stage is your advertising. And the premise is you can't ascend to another level until you have completed the one you're currently on. So first and foremost, we want to focus on our operations on Amazon. And the operations is largely going to be made up of, are we prime eligible and can we stay in stock? 
they're the, the two core components. There are a few other bits. We can dive into them if you like. But the two ones is prime and in stock. And again, we can dive more into each one, but I'll go over the whole thing first. Once we've nailed that, we then ascend to the brand. From a brand perspective, we're thinking about all the different touch points we have at our disposal where a customer's interacting with us or a prospect is interacting with us. The two primary ones are our storefront and our listing because that's where the conversion is ultimately happening. We have other storefronts like the unboxing experience, our packaging, our customer experience, which is all something to be aware of. But the brand touch points we really care about is those listing and the storefront. Are they optimized to the point where they've got highly engaging content and they solve the customer's problems so then we can convert those customers? Brilliant. That's step number two. We're now ready to move up. And at this stage, and only at this stage, can we start thinking about paid advertising and advertising as a whole, driving additional traffic. This is where your Amazon ads come in because it's kind of a very hot customer and we can tackle them why they're hot, problem and solution aware. We can get in there and put our product in front of them. But also we're thinking more up the funnel with social advertising as well. And we're driving traffic as well as utilizing an email list, which People are usually quite afraid to do um, because they don't want to lose their margin instead of sending them to the website. But we're utilizing this and driving paid traffic when we're in a position to convert it. And that's why the three layers work in that order. What we see a lot of is people get the order wrong. They try and go to that advertising straight away and they drive paid traffic to a listing that won't convert the customers at a high rate. Therefore, you're feeding information back to Amazon's algorithm saying, we're driving loads of traffic over here for these search terms, but we're not conversing that many. So therefore, we're not actually that relevant for this search term. And that's going to come into your bidding ability, how low you can bid, your cost per clicks. It's also going to impact your ranking. You're not necessarily going to go up the rankings if your conversion rate for a term is low. So there's many components and moving parts. The premise is simple. We don't want to be driving traffic unless we can convert it. And it doesn't really matter if you've got the best listing and the best traffic unless we can fulfill it and have that in stock rate nice and high and not lose any momentum there and also have that prime eligibility to drive those conversions and ranking up as well. So that's the core. Um, happy to dig into to any of those if you'd like, mate. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very interesting. It's a model that you guys can follow to really prioritize what to do because you, you should not, as you said, drive advertising to a non-optimized listing. I mean, this is that would be like a really uh, rookie mistake of, of a newbie. So don't make that mistake. So you should follow an order. And that order, it's the mountain strategy, this framework, follow the layers operations first, brand second, and advertisement third. So let's let's now dive deeper a little bit more into, into each layer and see what people actually can do to really take advantage of this model, which by the way, you guys will be able to, to download for free at the sellerprocess.com in the show notes of this episode. So George, what's, what's, uh, uh, what should we take care of first, the operation, what, what's in there? Sure. So I think with the operations, when we think about first and foremost, staying in stock, this is becoming a big issue right now with inventory storage limits on, on Amazon and people are getting um, blocked essentially from sending the amount of inventory they would like in because of capacity. A lot of the warehouses throughout Europe and US are reaching capacity. Hasn't happened since before COVID or since COVID's um, kicked off. It's, it's a new era. Um, what this means is we're not always able to be prime eligible. And what it also means is we're not able to get our stock in in a timely manner. It's creating a lot of headache, which means for some people, we're in and out of stock, which really hurts us when it comes to building momentum because we can invest really hard to get those sales and get the velocity going, that sales flywheel going. But when we then go out of stock and it stops, Amazon registers no sales for search terms for your product. So it's important first and foremost to have a secondary SKU, which would be a merchant fulfilled SKU. This wasn't something that was always recommended in the past, but now with the inventory limits, it's something that's widely recommended. Um, additionally, on top of that is having a 3PL, particularly in the US, that can get you into fulfillment centers quickly. So you're always trying to remain prime eligible um, or get back to prime eligible if you do go out of stock and prime. 
Obviously in Europe with the UK, you've got things like Seller Fill Prime as well, um, which is a solution not suitable for everyone. I actually worked in the team that helped set that up at Amazon UK. It really depends on the price and size of your item, but it can be a brilliant opportunity if you've got the operational capabilities in-house to actually get Prime across your whole range and never really go out of stock essentially because you can store so much more in your own fulfillment center. So focusing there on a prime SKU, a merchant fulfilled SKU is one, working with VPLs to get into Amazon quickly. Um, and also then obviously having um, seller fulfilled prime as an option as well, if it's suitable for your range. Absolutely. Yeah. Super important. I agree. And uh, obviously there is lots into the operation level, but obviously, uh, I mean, we, we don't have the time to cover it all, but essentially the most important things are really to, to stay in stock because of these uh, strange times now that uh, uh, it's more difficult to, to do so. Uh, so we, we need to really um, higher up our strategy and really make sure that we stay in stock because that's, that's going to be our competitive advantage now. And uh, so once we take care of the, the operations and our inventory, what, what, what's the next level? So the, the brand, what should we do in order to step up? Sure. I think when it comes to the brand, and let's just dig into the listing, for instance, where a lot of the conversions do ultimately happen. And then when we segment up that listing, there are a number of different areas we can focus on and look to enhance. So... First and foremost, one thing I always think of as a good rule of thumb, and everyone can do this as an action now, is remove all of the words from your listing. So the title, the bullet points, the description, get rid of all that information and look at your listing again, just from an image perspective. Ask yourself if the customer has enough information to make a well-informed decision about your product. And then ask yourself, do they have enough reason and kind of uh, are you compelling them to go by as well just based on the image because ultimately the the keywords are going to help you with the seo perspective no doubt they're going to help you with your advertising but they're becoming less and less important we really need to be answering customers problems and compelling them to buy using the images they're our most powerful asset on the detail page if we then look a little bit deeper we can look at the different number of images so I always say that the first image is arguably the most important thing about your whole brand on Amazon, because the first image is ultimately going to get you a click. If you don't get that click, then no one's going to see your second, third, fourth, fifth image. No one's going to see your A+. plus. No one cares. It doesn't matter because it's not seen. So we must obsess over that first image. And there's a number of things we can think about. One would be removing the white space. So ensuring with that square block that we have, we're minimizing the white space around the product that we have by trying to make the actual product as big as possible and looking at how we can shoot it differently, whether that's including packaging, whether that's incorporating an overlay, whether that's um, chopping the item in half. This is something I've seen Unilever recommend quite a lot where um, if you've got a shampoo bottle and it's a long item, it is tough to make it look good on a square image. There's loads of white space. So perhaps look to digitalize it a little bit by chopping it in half. So we just show the top half um, and the top half of the bottle is more square and we can reinforce some of the key points about the product, which may be wavy hair certified, for instance. And that's really clear from the search results page. So those unique selling points we want to tell the customer are clear from within the search results page. They don't have to go explore any further. And that's going to help you win more clicks and obviously drive up that click-through rate, driving up the traffic, driving up the sales. So there's some things to think about with the main image. The other follow-up to that would be split testing it. Never assume and just go with your gut. Try and get some data behind it if you can. Tools like PickFu, P-I-C-K-F-U.com are great. Granted, their data is American-based data. It's not European-based data, but it should give you some insight. Which are you more likely to click, this or that? Some people have Facebook groups, also great for split testing and going, hey, you're my customers, which image are you more like to click? Which one resonates with you? Which one do you like? Using polls and Facebook groups, are brilliant for this. Ask your own customers what resonates with them. Um, so there's just some points. I'm sure you've got a question or two. Any, any other follow-ups to that? Or I can continue, mate. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we can discuss in a little bit about that. But one thing I, I was thinking while you were saying that it's uh, 
first of all, like people should really know who their customer is. And uh, that's really something that we can never stress enough because uh, that, that's really one of the main mistakes. So we can talk about listing optimization. We, we cannot talk about listing optimization without knowing who our customer is. And uh, as George said, you know, the, the main image, it's really the, the most important part of our listing because it's the one that gets the click. So really you cannot, even start crafting your your main image if you don't know who your customer is right so so that's the i think you know the starting point of the whole like brand uh, layer right knowing who your customer is and then basically do everything else to please that customer to really make sure that it's in line with your customer right and definitely the main image is, is the main thing that after that you know if, if people don't click the your product uh, your everything else doesn't matter you know your a plus content and everything else doesn't matter because they will not even see that right so that's definitely one of the most important part is there anything else you, you, you were saying you wanted to add about this yeah i think you, you touched a good point about understanding your customer first um, like I worked with a dog brand some time ago and we noticed the Amazon data showed us that about 75% of customers were female. So when we're thinking about lifestyle images, where we're incorporating a human into that image and we're looking to paint a scenario of that customer experiencing the item and hoping to get a bit of an endorphin hit for them, future pace them slightly, it makes more sense to include a female in that because they can resonate more with that individual. Um, obviously study it, you may find that's not the case, but in theory that might make sense because they can see a woman giving some food to a dog and they can foresee themselves being that woman in that position. Whereas if you had a man there for argument's sake, giving food to the dog, perhaps they couldn't resonate that as much. But then again, there's the argument of does the man in your household normally feed the dog and that's his role in the, in the family. And they're usually to seeing that experience, perhaps. Um, but it's just something to think about um, when it comes to lifestyles as well. Um, another another big kind of component is getting those infographics right. This really answers that problem of if we remove all the text, the, the, the description, the bullets, the title, the infographics are really where we're selling the item. We're incorporating the features as well as the benefits. Obviously, as a rule of thumb, when it comes to any copywriting, we want to be speaking about the benefits because no one really cares about the features. Apple do this exceptionally well with that famous iPad advert at the start of lockdown when we were working from home. They didn't mention a single feature of the iPad. They just talked about the benefits. So instant login when it came to a FaceTime, seamless communication, crystal clear sound, super high quality video. They didn't say how many megapixels the camera was. They showed you with a benefit. Thinking about that with our infographics to ensure that we're leading with the benefits and conveying them in a, in a manner that is on brand. So it's not just some random font or random color. It's on brand. It's your font. It's your color scheme. It's your tone. And that's really powerful at building what I would refer to as a brand moat, um, which is tricky to do on Amazon because of how... Um, flexible people are when it comes to their buyer decisions and flipping between brands. But building a brand moat is really powerful because it encourages people to come back to you again and again. Um, and that starts with having content that is consistent across all of your um, all of your brand's assets, website, Amazon, social media. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree. And something, you know, I have seen happening in, in the Western world is that uh, they are kind of kind of copying you know what's happening in the in the in, in the eastern world so in china you know they are much more advanced in terms of uh, e-commerce and uh, uh, they were basically doing the, the same strategy of you know creating uh, storefronts and uh, and uh, all these features just for brand owners really like 10 years ago and i i used to live uh, six years in shanghai so i, I i've seen that happening and uh, it's basically happening the same thing with amazon right now so i i, I think jeff bezos it's kind of putting an eye on on tmall and uh, alibaba these these guys over there to 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 see what they're doing and uh, adapting a little bit to to how the, the future of e-commerce looks like Right, cool. So very interesting stuff, George. So uh, to move on with uh, the, to the next step of the of the pyramid is the advertisement advertising part. So which you you just mentioned includes uh, PPC and marketing. 
Is there anything else that we should be uh, aware of uh, in this section? I think a good rule of thumb when it comes to the advertising or just traffic as a whole is, is not having a single point of failure. And what I mean by this is never being reliant solely on one channel. So if Amazon advertising is working great for you, that's fantastic news. But if that is your source of all your income because you're reliant on it and you're not driving traffic from elsewhere, if the cost per clicks go up, if the competition goes up, you haven't got anything to fall back on. You've got nothing to support you. In the same token, if you're relying on Facebook ads and you then get blocked or suspended on Facebook, all your traffic can suddenly stop and that impacts the whole business. So a really good rule of thumb is even if Amazon advertising is working great, look at other avenues as well and also look to drive them onto Amazon. A lot of people argue we for driving traffic on social or our email, we want to drive it to the website. And that's fine. You are going to make more profit in the short term, but you've got to be asking yourself, what are your, what are your actual goals this year? Are your goals to be number one top seller on Amazon? Well, if they are, shouldn't you be investing in that goal? And the gold is there for a reason because we know that Amazon converts at a much higher rate. The repeat purchase rate can be really much higher on Amazon. Amazon can be better at winning or acquiring customers for us. So if we're investing in that goal, let's invest properly and drive traffic from off of Amazon onto Amazon to help us achieve that goal. Because another argument is customers are already shopping on Amazon. And if we ask them to come to our website, the conversion can go down. We can actually make less sales. The ROI could be less. So two points there. One is no single point of failure, utilizing the other assets we've got at our disposal. And two, kind of not getting disheartened when you lose some margin to Amazon and you're not sending it to the website because you may have never got the sale on the website. The conversion rate is that much lower. Um, and then another piece would be on organic traffic from off of Amazon, utilizing things like your email list, Facebook groups, social accounts to drive it to Amazon. Because when you launch, for argument's sake, you can get a real kickstart to that. Amazon wants new products on the platform. When you introduce it, they give you a, a halo effect, a grace period of about 10 to 14 days, like a leg up, essentially. We want to capitalize on that early momentum by sending our own traffic and getting those reviews to that 20 plus mark where we see conversion rate going up a lot. We want to get it to there as soon as possible and start feeding that algorithm as soon as possible. So utilize what you have, leverage that email, the social campaigns and send it to Amazon, particularly at the start. So from day one, you're hitting the ground running. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree. And that that's another big trend we're seeing, actually, the multi-channel, uh, using a multiple channel at the same time to drive traffic, because obviously we got more competition and it gives also more stability. And actually, one thing I want to um, stress here is that uh, now Amazon, it, it got a new, a, a new program that it's, it's refining you. 10% uh, of your sales if you are driving traffic from other sources. So guys, this is really the time to, to start driving traffic from external sources, not just PPC, because as we know in the US, PPC, it's, uh, it's getting very, very expensive. So it, it really won't hurt to, to try other sources of uh, traffic like Google or Facebook. But uh, I, I would guess Google, it's really a, a, good, a good avenue uh, to, to start with for sure. I think you make a good point there as well. Like Amazon advertising is getting more and more expensive. So that argument of a single point of failure, you're not necessarily failing on Amazon now because the advertising is going up, but it's not working quite as nice as it was a year, two years, three years ago. I and mean, additionally, if you're getting that kickback of the 10%, that can eradicate a lot of your fees as well. Um, and it reinforces, which I've been saying for a long time, Amazon wants that external traffic. So they're going to reward you when you're doing that. So not just before the last month where they've given you the 10%. Before that, they're obviously going to reward you from a sales rank perspective as well and give you a boost because you're giving them additional traffic. It's logical. Um, but yeah, final, final points on that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So guys, this is, uh, this is really a great fr framework that you can use in your business to prioritize your, your decisions. It really won't make sense to, to drive traffic to a, to a non-optimized listing. And also it will not make sense to optimize a listing if you're not able to, to get, uh, stay in stock and have, you know, the, the right, um, create basically the right products with the right packaging for the right customer. So really first, things first here this is the mantra you, you should you should really keep in mind uh, so first take care of the operations so stay in stock 
and, uh, and make sure you have the right product for the right audience. And second layer is to take care of your branding, your list, your listing, your images, your, your storefront and so on. And third, only third, you know, you, you should not uh, think this uh, around, you know, you should, you should not replace any layers of the, of the, of the strategy because it's, it's, uh, tested and, and makes, uh, obviously sense that to, to, to be that way. Third layer is the advertisement. So after you have that basement, after you have those pillars in place, you can really go hard and drive traffic and spend on PPC and, uh, drive external traffic potentially. So George, uh, here, uh, this, this was uh, absolutely a very valuable framework uh, for, for people uh, to, to learn and uh, have uh, imp implement that in their business. So I'm curious to understand how do you integrate this framework in like in your operations, like in practice, what do you do? Do you, do you have any, use any software or worksheet? Because this, this is basically a very high level, uh, high level uh, framework. So you, you have that in mind, but how can that apply like in real life in in your day day to day operations do you have any tools or things that support this strategy yeah so a lot of people talk about the amazon flywheel which jeff famously noted down on a, on a napkin um i've kind of worked on another flywheel for quite some time myself now and again we can share this to give some more insight to people um but in essence you've got your product sat in the middle of this flywheel and the faster that product circle spins, the higher your sales velocity. And that's what we're all chasing, sales velocity for keywords. So first and foremost, what we're doing is we're optimizing. That's going to be the first push to get this sales velocity going. And when we're optimizing, we're thinking about the, the graphic side, but we're also thinking heavily about the, the copy that we've got and the keywords that we've got in the listing, because that's going to help us with organic ranking. That acts as the first push to get the flywheel going. You know, a nice optimized listing, great keywords in it. It's going to give us some visibility. We're going to get conversions with the, those keywords in it, which in turn tells the algorithm this product's uh, a relevant product for this search term. Let's give it more, more ranking. That's the first push. What we then do following that is we start to, to drive traffic with marketing and we bid on these keywords and we push the traffic up further and we're exploring new keywords and we push, push, push. That's the second push where we're driving paid traffic. What then happens is we start to collect feedback. So I mentioned before, aiming for that 20-ish number as quickly as possible. We've seen the conversion rates go up. Once you go above 20 reviews, it was a good target. As that feedback comes in, we increase our conversion rate, which is great, obviously, because everything spins a little bit quicker when the conversion rate is higher. What's also happening is we're increasing our click-through rate because we've got the reviews on the search results page and we're increasing the performance of our marketing um, because we've got the reviews there as well when that's displayed. And finally, we're getting keywords inside of that listing as well, which helps with the organic piece because we've got keywords like um, that are related to our target keywords inside of the copy, inside the reviews and the feedback. So that's going to bolster as well. So that is the third big push there. And in itself, that does its job if we continue just doing that process. But what we ought to be doing is looking at the data that we're collecting. And this is what really separates kind of a five-figure from a six- and seven-figure seller is the, the power of the data that we collect. So the marketing, for instance, actually harvests loads of data for us, loads of insights. What we want to be doing is extracting that data. The feedback also harvests loads of insights into how our customers communicate, the terms they use, how they describe the product, the pain points, how we can solve questions that they had. So we pull all of that data out. And what we then do is throw it back into optimization. We go back to our listing and maybe we solve some of the problems that the feedback has told us about. Maybe we include some of the keywords that the marketing has told us about and we re-optimize. And that pushes the flywheel again. It's another surge of energy. What we also do is take that data and we throw it back into the marketing campaigns to make them more refined, make them more optimized, to push out and run more experiments and try different things and try different language and terms, which then in turn is another push on the marketing piece. And as the feedback then goes up, because the velocity is up, the marketing pulls in more data as the velocity is up, we repeat this process over and over again. And it is a regular occurrence for us to harvest the data that we get and re-optimize and remarket over and over again. 
Absolutely, yeah. That that drives decisions, and it's uh, it's even more true now that uh, the competition is really high. And uh, so basically, the the product flywheel it's uh, it's a virtuous cycle. You gotta create momentum to for your product to to gain more reviews, which in turn gets you know increase your conversion rate, which in turn makes your your marketing efforts more more effective, which in turn basically feed this whole this whole um, flywheel, this whole cycle. And and it, it, it basically uh, comes over over and over again. You know, you you get more sales and uh, conversion rates improve. You get more data, and from data you can improve your product and and make and uh, yeah improve your listing, and uh, which in turn should also uh, make your your conversion rate higher. So it's uh, it, it's it's uh, you you gotta create momentum basically. You 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 follow mm -hmm. this this product flywheel to create momentum for your product. So George, it was was uh, really a, like a value packed episode. We want to try to to make it uh, keep it short and sweet with lots of information. Definitely, we got a lot here. So uh, guys, the key to success is to emulate the best. So so go steal these two powerful frameworks from George and start implementing them in your business now. So you you can get a copy of these two frameworks in the in the show notes of the episode of, at the sellerprocess.com. So uh, George, it's been a great conversation. Tell people where they can find you if they want to reach out. Sure. Um Thank you again for having me on. To, to kind of grab my details, you can probably get me on LinkedIn is the best place where I communicate most at George Reed, R-E-I-D. And then georges.blog, you'll find all of the content I pretty much produce from podcasts to creative ideas to, to things I'm learning about Amazon every week. Awesome, awesome. George, it's been a pleasure having you here and I hope to see you again. Good man. Thanks so much, Marco. I'll speak to you very soon. Changemakers, I hope you enjoyed the show and learned something from the interview. I'd like to leave you with my favorite quote. Remember, we don't rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. You will not reach your targets just because you set them. You will reach your targets because you have implemented systems in your business that allow you to reach those targets. Burn that in your mind. And what I'd like you to do is to go grab the free resources of this episode on the sellerprocess.com and work to keep systematizing your business and creating better processes. And I'll see you in the next episode.